Ladies, gentlemen and others, today I am joined by none other than Malini Agarwal, founder and creative director of formerly a DJ on Mumbai's Radio 1 and head of digital content for Channel V India. She's been a professional dancer among the many hats that she's worn through her career. It is just so interesting that you are an absolute level of a multi-hyphenator, Malini. She is also an author of the book To the Moon. She has her second book coming out by the end of 2023. An absolute self-made internet sensation and easily one of the kindest people I've had the privilege of meeting through this space. She creates content on everything from Bollywood gossip, fashion, style, travel. I absolutely adore her trendy dance moves. So without further ado, let me welcome you to my podcast. Welcome to The Real Deal with Anna. Anna, what a wonderful introduction. I'm excited to be here. I'm always so happy to see you. I think we've overlapped for so many years of this journey. So it's always nice to see a familiar, friendly face. You are someone, I think, I'd like to say, of course, that you're a friend over the years, but you were someone that I met, I think, was it Grand Hyatt at Lakme Fashion Week? Must have been fashion years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I, do, I have this very clear picture of you moving around with a laptop. Yeah, you were an all-in-one figure that was doing so much. And when I look at you today, with your team of five around you at all times, you have your own entourage. Can I just say, I feel proud, I feel happy, I have no part to play in it, but it just feels so fulfilling. To watch you grow as much as you have, you were one of the first creators, if not the very first creator, to really turn this space into a business, a company. You had structure, you had, I've been to your offices over the years. I've had the privilege of working with your company. Um, you have the nicest team, I have to say. How much do you think has changed over 13 years, right? Of you? Yeah, 13 years. I think everything has changed. Everything has absolutely changed. And just from the technology alone, like you were saying, when I used to run around Fashion Week, I would have my, my the oldest of the oldest MacBooks. And then I would have my, you know, pink, little pink camera, the LPC. Uh, because cell phones were just, you know, they didn't really, they weren't smartphones at that time. They barely did anything. Uh, and then I would have a little flip camera where I would record my videos and half the celebrities didn't even understand. They're like, what are you filming on? I'm like, oh, it's this little camera device that plugs into my laptop. So the technology has changed. Uh, I think the platforms have changed. When I started, it was a blog on WordPress. Um, now, you know, you have micro blogging across every possible social media platform. And every day some new platform comes along, some disappear and I think that's what's been really exciting about it, that it's just really evolved. To this day, my mom still has no idea what I do, I think, <laughs> to some degree. Uh, she has a funny story. She used to tell everyone that I'm an internet blocker. Internet block blocker. blocker. So her logic, she's so sweet. She's 83 now. Uh, this is maybe when she was 75 or something. She started telling people that, you know, uh, as regular people, we get so much spam. Um, and celebrities must get like 10 times that amount. So that's what Malini does. She blocks their spam. She thought I was an internet blocker. I thought that was amazing though. And it was just like, that's because she couldn't really wrap her head around the whole digital magazine or uh, blog. I mean, it was a hobby blog to start with. So you can't blame her. But I think when I look back, the first iteration of what I did was my gossip column in Midday, which is the local tabloid called Malini's Mumbai, probably 25 years ago. And that's, uh, I found like a 17-year-old copy recently. And I used to write this column about what I was doing, the rich and famous, fashion, beauty, and lo and behold, the print version turned into the blog many years later. And I probably didn't even realize that that's what had happened. So yeah, everything has changed. <laughs> that is so beautiful because there are so many ways you realize that this was just meant to be. It was just different pieces of the puzzle coming together. For sure. That's why I always, when I look back and when people say, how do I know what to pursue? I said, you know, even when I was a backup dancer for, dancer for Sukhbir, you learn something from every job. Like I learned teamwork, right? With dancing, if you do a choreography and you're not in sync with the rest of the crew, it doesn't work. You all have to work as a team. Everyone's hands have to be at the exact same height, at the exact same moment, with the exact same, you know, attitude. Uh, so I think that's kind of things that I've learned there. I think the best and most important lesson, which is why I love this medium of podcasting, uh, is the lesson I learned on radio. Because I did radio for nine years, various shows, various stations. My favorite show was a drive time show uh, on Go 92.5 Now Radio 1 called Horn OK Please. And I used to do fun games with people. And the best lesson I learned from the, you know, the, the MD there, Tariq Ansari, was even if you're broadcasting to millions of people, radio or the audio medium is a very personal experience. So six people might be sitting in a car, but everyone's having a very individual experience with you. So that's why we all think our favorite RJs are so good looking, because in the theater of our mind, and I love that term, we have pictured them a certain way. 
And that's what I, you know, I really took from that is that when I used to host my show, I would imagine my best friend in the empty chair across from me and tell her things in an excited way, more excited than I would normally. And that's literally the same vibe and ethos I took to the blog. So instead of writing the blog like a magazine or a news report, I wrote it as letters to my friend. And which is why when you read it, it feels very much people, even when they read my book, they say, oh, it sounds like you. It feels like I'm listening to you. Um, and you can tell me about that because you've read the book, which is very nice. So I think that that's where it came from. And that's kind of where like every job teaches you something. And you're so right. It was all meant to be. It all came together, whether I was part of the first dot com bubble boom and bust at MTV in 2003. I remember I used to uh, I, I went to, a, you know, interview for a job at Asia Content. I didn't even know that they run the MTV website. So I had just finished doing a job at uh, Activate Technologies where I set up the first Mumbai portal for midday called Chalo Mumbai. And I had written the Bible for it on what are the dissections going to be and what are the different things that we're going to write about. And then um, I went for the, this interview and they said, OK, I'll be honest with you. The role is to write all the romance content for MTVIndia.com. And I was like, you're going to pay me to write about love all day? This is amazing. <clears throat> and I remember my salary is 18,000 rupees. I was super thrilled. And I used to write all the love line. Then, then I used to also write all the love line questions and answers. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it was really fun. And I used to and then and then, you know, we've just come up with different romance tests and things that are happening. And then there was this big bubble that burst. And suddenly 15 people from Asia content were stripped down to the last four. And luckily I was one of the remaining four because they downsized because everyone's like, oh, the Internet doesn't really it's not working. People are not going to these websites. And I was marched into the main MTV office. And that's where I met Cyrus Oshidar. And he asked me, can you write promos? And I said, what's a promo? And he said, oh, you know, when we're advertising a new show. And I said, I can give it a whirl. I used to get paid 2,000 rupees a promo. And that's when he used to write, presenting, tomorrow, coming at you. I swear you're right. Like literally that, just like five sentences. And I was thrilled to do that. And then I started to write uh, Nikhil Chanapa's scripts. I used to write all of his MTV scripts. And that's kind of all been the evolution of that too. And I think what I learned about the big change, which was, again, the big internet change was, at that point, there was no social media. So everyone was sitting on their islands making this content, but no one knew. And what really worked, I think, in this next round when I started the blog is I was already on Twitter. I was on Facebook. I was I had started using Twitter as a means for communication with my radio audience. I used to tell them to tweet me their song requests. And funnily enough, one day, Mihir Joshi, who's a really sweet RJ friend of mine, uh, tagged Imran Khan on Twitter and said, hey, you should catch my friend's show. She plays the kind of music you like. And I said, hey, Imran, you should drop into the studio sometime. Never in a billion years thinking he's going to do it. And he said, agreed, I'll do it. One condition, you call the show Pirate Radio. And this all happened on Twitter back in like 2006 or something. And um, I said, OK. And he came out, no, nine maybe. And he came to the studio. And the reason he wanted to call it Pirate Radio is because there's a movie called Pirate Radio about how private radio was not allowed in London and all of Britain. So they used to do these radio stations on ships so that they could play pop music, which wasn't allowed. And so we did this and I, I did a show with him where I said, OK, you're a Bollywood actor, but we're not going to talk about Bollywood. We're going to play 40 of your favorite songs and you tell me why you love them. And that just took off. So I did a show with him Then I had Rahul Khanna and, um, you know, Rahul Bose and various different Bollywood. Stars. And that was the that was the beginning of everything, which Mary, eventually which turned, turned into the blog. And yeah. I used to uh, if you go back to my YouTube, I have these really grainy old videos of Imran Khan and Rahul Khanna sitting across from me at the radio station. And I was just recording clips of them uh, while I was doing my show. And I had no concept of this. There was no big YouTubers. I was just playing along. And, and you laugh if I tell you how I used to do my videos. I used to, I, I was like, okay, maybe I should do a Bollywood update on YouTube. So I used to, I have this tiny room. I used to draw the curtain behind me so you can see the mess in my room. And I would put this little tripod with my flip camera on top of it. I would have the midday newspaper on the other side and I would read out the latest gossip and record myself and upload it on YouTube. And those videos are still there. And that was the beginning of my YouTube channel. You know, every time we speak, I realize that I usually am called oh, OG creator, first gen creator. I'm like, no, bro, she's the OG creator. She's been around since even before me. And I knew two or three names when I was starting out 11 years ago. There was Brian Boy. Um, there was one or two other names that now in this very moment I can't remember. And of course, then there was your name. And because you were the only Indian name I knew, there really wasn't much else to look up to, literally, or even just get an idea of what's happening. Um, 
what I'm going where I'm going with this is that because you've been around for so long, how have you managed to maneuver the relevant trade? Because that's a big one for us. It's something that looms over our heads, and for anybody that really lives in the public eye, because the truth of it is out of sight, out of mind, right? The funny said, Brian, boy, I met him. It was so fun. I'd gone for something. I can't work, Clico or something. And that's what because there were no other bloggers here. So like 15 years ago, they would just invite me to everything. And um, and I remember meeting him and being so excited because I've met, you know, my my idols at that point in terms of blogging was like Perez Hilton, Just Jared, Brian Boy, all of that. And um, I think one of the things that I saw and which I think sort of leads into the answer to this question is that everyone's making it up as they go along, right? So I think the key for me were two things. One, I realized that you know, the big mistake we all make is we're like, oh, no, I don't understand this or this I can't do. Whether it comes to I don't understand new technology, which is our parents' generation that says, oh, I don't understand, you know, how to use the phone or I don't understand these platforms. Or a creator says, oh, I don't understand TikTok, but I can understand Facebook. You know, so I think the mistake we make is we use all these negative sort of switch words that convince ourselves that this, you know, hope I go, that this is where we draw the line. I think for me, relevance has really been about combination of enthusiasm and formal. I don't want to feel like I'm missing anything. So I've always wanted to explore new things until the point that, okay, maybe I don't understand it, then I have to let it go. So I think to stay relevant, one, yes, while we started as a blog, when blogging was the it thing, if we had only stayed in the blog and not adopted social media, we would have become irrelevant. So we maintained, uh, plat- we were platform agnostic. So we were on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, the work. So even to this date, if you look now, you'll see creators who have a lot of following on Instagram, but like very little on Twitter. We've sort of maintained all of our platforms at the same time. Um, Snapchat, for the longest time, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. And then one day the penny dropped. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it now. It's more instantaneous. And then stories is Snapchat. So if I'd said no to that back in the day, it was never have worked. I think the key is being open to new things and not taking yourself too seriously. Because if you convince yourself that, oh, but I'm a serious, you know, first of all, you can't say serious gossip columnist, but I'm a serious <laughs> journalist or whatever it is that I don't do this or just how, you know, there was this big war between YouTubers and TikTokers to TikTokers saying that, no, but they're not serious content creators. And today they're ruling the roost or, you know, Bollywood saying, oh, influencers, we're not ever going to work with them. But now they're dancing with every creator known to man to promote their films. So never say never. That's how you stay relevant. And, you know, try new things. So, you know, as much as I felt like, okay, can I really stand in front of my ring light and sing and dance and do all of those things? I'm like, why not? Okay, one, I am a dancer. And two, maybe I'll do it my own way. So when there's a trending reel, I'll make it about women's empowerment or I'll make it about girl code or I'll make it something that's relevant to me. You just have to stay true to the core of yourself. I went to Malaysia Social Media Week and I learned a really cool uh, trick to figure out who you are. Because the big dilemma for me was there was no precedent set, right? So I was used to wonder, I'm like, look, I'm not a Bollywood star. I'm not a Kim Kardashian and I'm not a makeup guru. You know, like if you ask me to do a makeup tutorial, you find it super simple. I find it really horrifying to do my own makeup, right? Um, So for me, it was really like, okay, who am I? What am I? Doesn't make any sense because there isn't anyone to follow in their footsteps, right? I love an Oprah. I love an Ariana, but they're not dancing in front of their ring light. But I think that's when it really hit me that, you know, maybe you can be new, And that's where I sort of was able to carve an identity for myself. And the reason I gave the name myself, Miss Malini, is the alliteration. Um, I didn't want to go with the whole Bollywood gossip girl and all of that. And ironically enough, it stuck. So many people to this day ask me what my real name is. I said Malini, obviously. (laughs) But it's funny because I realized that they think maybe it was just a gimmick that I was just trying to do. And I was like, that's literally what I was trying to avoid. Um, It'd be so funny if my name was like, yeah, I'm Anisha, but call me Miss Malini. Like that would be so random. And then I realized that, okay, now I figured out that I don't need to be like anyone else. I can be my own version of myself. And that opens up the whole world to, well, then is it okay if I'm dancing in front of my ring light? Is it okay if sometimes I decide that I'm going to do a live putting on my no skincare routine, skincare routine that gives you a lot more freedom and breathing room if you make uh, the rule for yourself that there are no rules for what I'm going to do. And I think that was kind of easier for me because nobody else was there to point that many fingers. You know, I realized this this whole conversation that we have as creators about validation is a new phenomenon. When I started 15 years ago, I would finish my day at work. I had three jobs. I used to do my radio show, do the graveyard shift. I used to work all day at Channel V. And then I would start writing the blog at midnight till 4 a.m. So whatever I had done that day, I would document that in the blog. 
and I would finish the blog and I would post it and be super satisfied. And you know what didn't come next? That feeling of how many people liked it. How quickly did they like it? And tomorrow morning when I wake up, do they still like it or do they like something else more? I did not have this flood of the need for validation. I didn't even know that I needed validation at that point. And the funny thing that validation has become about now is not so much about how many people like you. It's you start worrying about what will people, other people think about how many people like you. But I think that that's one of the things that, you know, I always talk about being that I was born in 1977. So I'm Gen X. I'm not even like, I'm, a, I'm in a weird generation. I'm not a millennial. I'm one before with one foot with the landline and one with the digital device. And still keeping up with Gen Z, might I add. And, and the thing is, that's the thing. I think that you don't have to put yourself into a box because I didn't really have one. Um, and I feel that for me, what what became really important is that I still remember how good it feels just to create without the need to validate. I love that you touched upon validate because the way I see it is that when all of us started, and I'm talking about all, when I say all of us, it's before this really did become an industry, industry, right? Before we were able to monetize it, let's put it like that. It really was about the satisfaction of being able to share. I mean, personally, I remember the first time I bumped into someone at a mall and said, oh my God, I went shopping here and bought so-and-so shirt because you had it and recommended it. And that was the validation we were probably chasing and looking after, and not the number of likes you had or comments you had. But I love that you said um, that actors, for example, right? There was there is a whole generation. I'm not saying just Bollywood actors. There is a whole generation that loves to diss influencers. We're the low hanging fruit. We're the easy target. You can call us influencers all you want, um, but I mean, every marketing plan today includes us. We may hate the term. Personally, I've always used content creator influences, a recent adoption in my own vocabulary for myself. But I feel like there is this whole sect that has that has absolutely had to adopt us in way of life. See, much. honestly, I'll tell you what, and I've realized this, I think, maybe with age and wisdom, all um, ire, hatred, anger comes from a place of ignorance just not knowing the difference and also feeling that, wait a minute, I had to work so hard to get to where I am and suddenly they can just post three things without any skill and be an influencer, right? So I hear this from different people, right? So you'll have a makeup artist saying, but they haven't trained, right? But I also look back at my journey and say, I didn't train to be an entertainment journalist, right? I studied English literature, I love to write and I love Bollywood films. And that's why I always... Whenever I wrote, I wrote my content, never, or even when I attended Fashion Week, I have no place saying this is good or bad. I said I liked it or I didn't understand it. I never said blanket, it's good or bad um, because it's my personal opinion. And one opinion doesn't, you know, dictate everybody's. And I think that there's been an interesting shift that happened because the numbers have taken over, right? So celebrities are also realizing that, okay, they need to play the influencer game. They need to, you know, be friends with creators. But I've seen an interesting thing. Um, you know how on social media, you, you if you get a message from someone with a lot of followers, you'll be super happy and you speak to them a different way. But um, unlike Black Mirror, luckily, so <laughs> we don't walk around with a number on our head. So when you walk into a room, you don't know who is an influencer or who's important according to the internet yet. So the, literally, so the second book I'm writing is called Under the Influence. And it's literally about this, which kind of talks about these two things. You know, we have a common friend, Ridge, who said something interesting to me once. He said, you know, we all complain about the toxic internet, but it's not an alien nation that showed up. We are social media. So we are the only ones who can fix it. And I think this is also part of that. I think that for celebrities, they're kind of navigating this new world where suddenly they have to have a social media presence. They can make more money from it. They might have less followers than a content creator who has, I mean, like Jannat has more uh, followers in Ranveer Singh, right? Does that make it good or bad? I'm like, good for her, right? Yeah. She's got that. But she doesn't have the same skill set as Ranveer Singh and he doesn't have the same skill set as she does. So I think it's a matter of being able to play in the same pond without saying that everyone has to do the same things to be invited. And I think that's been the big shift that people are like, okay, now we can have various different species of fish in the same pond and we can play together without cannibalizing or eating each other up. And I think for me, that's been part of the journey. And, and I'm quite proud of having, I think, to some degree, helped bridge that gap because we launched Miss Valani Trending um, sort of, you know, in anticipation and excitement of creators. We, you know, used to cover Bollywood and then we're like right up next to Shah Rukh Khan. We're talking about Anam, you know, and I thought that it's important to give creators the validation because I know how hard it is and how much work it takes. 
And that's why I think that's the goodwill that we've built. And that's what I'm trying to do now is sort of build that bridge between celebrity and creator. So, I, you know, if I do an actor circle where I have a Bollywood star, but 20 creators who are aspiring to be actors, who, by the way, might have more followers sitting in the audience, uh, but may not have the access or the skill and are still excited to meet that Bollywood star. It's important to bridge that gap. And I think it's so important. And I, and I did a TEDx about this. We have to, at, as creators ourselves, at least unsee the numbers and see the people. Yes, numbers are important. Of course, it matters because how many people are going to give you work? They're going to see your engagement. They're going to see your numbers. Yes. But for yourself and what I've done for myself, I have turned off being able to see people's likes. I just don't want to know. Like, I, I don't want that to be my first thing that I look at. I want to look at the content. I've also turned off people seeing mine so that I can stop stressing about it. I'm like, if they're coming and they're enjoying the content, they're enjoying the content. I don't want this to be the first thing that my eye goes to. And I've been trying to, as a basis of what I did with the book, is to say, okay, let me equate everything that happens online to a real life experience of it. And I'll like unpack that for you. You know, we all think of ourselves as good people. But I realized through my journey, I was an accidental troll. I was under the influence myself where I would be writing about celebrities and being like, oh, I hope I don't run into them. And then I'm like, well, I can't do that. So I made that rule for the blog many years ago that we will only write what we can say to somebody's face. Now, as a gossip blog, you realize that leaves very little left to be put on the table. So 80% of the things I know I don't say or I wouldn't put out there as gossip, but it still worked. And there's a reason for it, that there is room for a happy, positive version of content and people will consume it if you put it in front of them, you know? Just like people will eat healthy if you just give them give give them something delicious, like healthy to eat, but in delicious looking packaging in that sense. So I think that's kind of what has been key for me. And I think what's been really important is building out my understanding of constantly checking myself to say, okay, would I do this in real life? For example, if someone's having a conversation on Instagram, right? Someone's posted something, three people comment. It's completely normal for someone to come in and put some completely random comment up there, right? It's not surprising. But imagine in the real world, if you were having a party at your house and somebody just burst the door open, put up a poster of themselves and left without saying anything, you'd call the police. But we don't apply that. We have normalized a lot of very questionable behavior, even by ourselves, allowing ourselves to be who we're not. So we need to fix all of that, I feel. I feel like one of the things you said has stuck with me, which is about how absolutely everyone is now welcome in the realm of, you know, yeah. just being famous and being on the internet. And um, I was with someone a couple of weeks ago who said, who's a newer creator. And they said to me that while I can show you how to style this shirt in many ways, I am not good at understanding the strategy behind it. Or I'm not good at analyzing the data of what's doing well business wise, right, per se. And there's this um, new job designation that I heard of, which is essentially content direction, content strategy, mm -hmm. where you hire someone who will tell you exactly what to do and what not to do. Yeah. And to me, that was I was like, wait, what? Because I've always we've always just done that ourselves. Sure. Yes, saying you have. I mean, all of us have, of right? Um, so what what where I'm going with this is there's this new breed of creators that know exactly what to do and what not to do. So they kind of have seen all of these different career graphs. Unlike you had probably only Perez or or just Jared, like you said. Um, and me, who just said you, pretty much, you know. And I was like, okay, so now you know exactly what to do. You know exactly what not to do. You get managements and PR reps very early on in your careers. Your production value and aesthetic value is brilliant from the get-go. But oh my God, that must also feel like a lot of pressure because we had the room to fuck up when we did. Yeah. And now the new a lot of creators, unfortunately, don't have the privilege of messing up because now it's a career. You've got to go guns blazing because it's so much more competitive and there's so much more pressure than when we started out. I think there's, yeah, there's both sides to the coin. Of course, there's lots more pressure, there's lots more competition, but it's also much more, um, it's more recognized as a career. So I'll tell you the struggle. When people always ask me, was it a struggle? And I'm like, actually, it wasn't a struggle. I loved most of the journey. The real struggle I ever had was explaining to people what I did in terms of how is it okay? And this is so funny now when you when I tell you this, it'll sound ridiculous. How is it okay for you to be paid for the content you put up? Now it seems like, no, that's totally fine. Content creators get paid all the time. I used to get that question all the time, but that's not ethical. How can you be writing about something and how can you be writing about a product and promoting a product as a human being? You're not a magazine, you're not a TV channel. This is not an advertisement. How can you, Malini, post about your wedding? 
Now, wedding content is rife, right? Like, like we were just talking about Sid and Kiara's weddings all over the internet. But I used to get that kind of grief. That how is it okay that you're a blogger and you're selling me something? And now it's ridiculous, right? So that's the, the other flip Seems side. like a whole other world. My mind, right? Like, 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 it's not, you can't fathom that. But people would get really upset. I got so much flack for documenting my wedding. And I wasn't getting paid to do my wedding. I paid for my wedding. But I was so thrilled to be getting married. I documented a series called The Domestically Challenged Desi Bride. I remember that. And I documented it. And then some people said, oh, do you want to give away something in your wedding goodie bag? I said, great. And I said, that's so sweet. And I actually posted about it. It wasn't even transactional. They were because they knew me as an RJ and stuff. There wasn't even this thing. There was no uh, organized sector that said, you have to give me X amount of posts. I didn't even have an Instagram. Didn't have those. Because yeah, I didn't, didn't have an iPhone, so I didn't have Instagram. So I could put it on my blog, but there wasn't even a requirement to do that. Um, it was just that it's going to be given to the guests at my wedding. And I got so much grief for it. And it's so funny now that I look back and I'm like, you know, everyone has their own struggles. The grass is always greener on the other side. But when I look at it from the creator perspective today, it's an organized industry. It's a career. It's a business. You can sign up and have, like you said, all the tools, management from the get-go, understand the kind of creator you want to be, um, collaborate with other creators, grow your following, do all those things where, yes, we had more room to fuck up, but there was also less people listening or understanding what we were doing. So a majority of even, you know, like Mike, who's been with me for 13 years, is my business partner and co-founder, I had to knock down so many doors to explain to brands why they should advertise on the internet, how we can give them real numbers and explain exactly who's seeing it as opposed to this many people cross this billboard, but you don't really know the exact demographic age or, you know, anything. And that's what, you know, so I think we did a lot of the groundwork for the creators today to sort of make this uh, an accepted industry. But when you look back at it, for me, I'm kind of like, you know, it's 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 so much easier now to, to get, uh, you know, it's all, it's all out there, but it, there is more competition because there's less people doing it. Yeah, you walked so they could run. That's yeah, the way I, I see it. So, yeah. <laughs> Over the years, has there been a particular brand partnership that really stands out to you? And I'm saying that specifically because now, like you said, it's so much more transactional. Um, I feel like also our relationships with brands and our like, it was us with them earlier and now there's like 50 agencies in the middle, different PR people in the middle. It's one big long chain. Um, so I'm probably asking you about something that goes a little bit way back, which is probably a deal that you closed yourself or Mike closed directly and there wasn't like 50 people in the middle. You know what I really liked? There was the deal that we did with um, L'Oreal and it was for lipstick and it was really sweet because I had a team of all girls at that point, seven girls, and some of them had just joined. And I said that, hey, why don't we do something different instead of us just putting up pictures of your campaign on my blog and on my social media? Why don't you shoot my team uh, with makeovers and do a different lipstick shade for each of them? And they're all different body types, different skin complexions. And we did a shoot. And I'll, I'll send you that picture. It's stunning. And the girls from my team felt so good. And there were real girls in this content. I'm talking, I'm still getting goosebumps over 10 years ago, which was not something people did because there was no influencers. But that is literally, if you look at a flashback today in 2023 of like 2013, what it would look like if you had 12 female creators in a, you know, image together showing different, you know, girl power of all different sizes and shapes. That was the template. And I remember we were, the team was so excited. They got to shoot, they got their hair and makeup done and they came up to me and said, I can't believe this is my job. And that was amazing. And I think that really stands out for me because the brand really got it, you know, and I'm, I'm looking back, I'm really impressed because that's not usually what they do, especially that. And these were not influencers. They were just girls from Miss Malini's team and me. Um, and they it just came out really nice and they all posted about it and it became like a really nice template. The other one I remember, I think, is probably my very first uh, collaboration. So for the first year when I started, there was no money. It was a lot of it was barter. Everything was that barter system. We'll give you this and you write this. And it was completely acceptable to do that. And I think the first ever trip I took was to Delhi for Levi's. They had launched their three body shapes of denims. And I remember that's when uh, Jacqueline Fernandez, Ileana de Cruz and Chitrangada were there. And I just did something with Chitrangada recently and I pulled up the blog and showed her a shoulder and she was like, oh my gosh. And it was so many years ago. And I could not wrap my head around the fact that they were flying me to Delhi to go and stay in a five-star hotel <laughs> to and get a pair of jeans, of Levi's jeans to go and, and uh, you know, take some pictures and blog about this. And I was super thrilled. And and I remember, you know, my husband now was the CEO of my company and my heart, as I say, as we complete 11 years of being married. 
um, he was, you know, he was at the Harvard Business School when I started the blog. And he was like, you know, he came back and he told me, this is big business. Like we should, you know, you should do this. My plan was to finish. He finished his business school and I was going to relocate to Europe with him somewhere. I had no plan to stay here. And uh, it took off and he came back and he joined Namura and as a, uh, you know, basically in finance. He was an investment banker. And then one day he came skipping out and joined as my CEO. And him and Mike gave me the confidence to say, we can do this as a business. I mean, many, many years ago, uh, someone came to me and said, we'd like to buy the, the blog. I was like, why would you buy the blog? Like, it's just a page on the internet. And they offered me 25 lakh rupees and a salary on top of that. And they said, we'll pay you a lakh and a half a month and we'll give you 25 lakh now and we'll own the blog. And I thought that sounds great to me 15 years ago or 13 years ago. And that's what Mike and Nashad convinced me. I said, no, there's something here. We should do this ourselves. And I said, I'll only do it if you stick with me. And 13 years later, they're still there. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I mean, you had the opportunity to walk out at that point. I did. And that's not a small amount of money for someone who's got a day job. And 11 years ago, 25 lakhs was like it's a lot of money. And it's, and it's a lot of money to say that I'm also going to give you a lakh and a half to just write your hobby blog on the side. I was like, that sounds great. And at that point, I was doing radio. I was channel, you know, digital content head. So and my, it never crossed my mind to be an entrepreneur. I always used to wonder on him. I used to look at people who start their own businesses and say, why does anybody do that? Why wouldn't you want to just work in a big company like work at Apple or, you know, Google or Yahoo or whatever and, and make lots of money and, you know, say that I work at this fancy company. And then I now I get it. Ever since I started my company, I'm, I'm like, now I get it. Now I could never work for anybody else. But that's also because your authenticity stuck through, right? It yeah. Literally, I mean, looking back at the L'Oreal example you just mentioned, I feel like if there was anybody else in your position, they probably would have taken those campaign images and put it on the website. But you have sure. the foresight to say, hey, let's make it unique. Let's do something else. I have seven, you know, team members over here that would fit right in. Yeah. Let's make a Miss Malini L'Oreal camp campaign. Yeah. In the spirit of keeping things very real, can you tell me a little bit about the lows? I mean, I'm yeah. sure it hasn't all been as rosy as today in hindsight, we realize, right? I mean, I know that mental health can take a huge toll on every creator out there, whether new or someone that's been around for a while. Um, even leaving aside the angle of validation, which back in the day we may not have had, I feel like you've had more struggles than you're definitely letting go. Of course, no, and I, I talk about it very openly. I think that the big struggle is, you know, um, you know, starting a company when you when you're when you're on your own, you pay your own bills, you write about yourself. When you own when you when you run a company, you're not responsible for multiple lives. So when it started with six people, it's smaller. And then it got to like close to 100. And then, you know, even with pandemic and everything, raising money has always been like not been my strong suit. And I always struggled with why didn't people understand it? OK, now it's all roses because we got acquired and few, you know, overnight success only took 13 years. Mm -hmm. But I used to come across this one thing that drove, drove me crazy, this concept of key man insurance, because, again, it was so new. People didn't understand the idea of uh, a personality led brand. So they said, but Miss Malini, what if you get hit by a bus? Oh, the company dear. is gone. The amount of people who said that, I would have, I, if I got a penny for every time somebody said I got hit by a bus, I should be a millionaire by now. And I'm like, first of all, if you look at Apple or something, even if Steve Jobs got hit by a bus, Apple doesn't close. It's also a slightly patriarchal thinking that because it's called Miss Malini. Mm -hmm. Same thing like they call my husband Mr. Malini. I mean, if I worked at MrNoshan.com, nobody would call me that. Weren't you also asked a hundred times if you're going to change the blog to be Mr. Mrs. Malini? Mrs. Malini. Yes. I remember that. And everyone does it with, oh, like as if it's the first time I've heard this, a slow clap for them. I'm like, then it would be Mrs. Rizwanullah.com. <laughs> but Burkinis. But, you know, the thing is, I think that's the thing. You know, I've never had such like a very overt... Uh, you know, sexist experience in my career. Being a woman has actually been to my betterment because being this young girl with a little flip camera, they're like, chalo, ashe chiti ke beti aage chale jao when the sweaty big camera guys were in the pit. So it actually worked for me, you know, and even it's, celebrities were not as intimidated or maybe they felt that I was, you know, you know, that, that I was not going to, you know, I was not intimidating at all. And I wasn't going to ask them something creepy. So I think that worked for me. But I think that this, these are the little things, these struggles. And then, you know, the thing is with funding, it takes so long. People will say, oh, yeah, we're giving you $5 million. And then by the time the paperwork gets done and delays happen, you really, so we really, that was a big pain point. And, you know, I live a very luxurious life to the world outside because we have a lot of perks as creators, free trips to the Maldives. None of my clothes I own. I borrow everything and post about it. So I live a great, absolutely phenomenal life, but I live it on a very shoestring budget because all my money was in the company always. Um, so I didn't have any savings, you know. So if it went bust, that was it. Game over. For me, it was still OK because I built a brand for myself. Tomorrow, even if Miss Malini's company, God forbid, shut down, 
Malini Agrawal would get a job somewhere because I've built uh, a brand for myself, a name for myself. But then I always think about Nashad and Mike and all the other people. You know, if you shut a company down, put the lock on the door, you know, tens of hundreds of people walk out jobless and they have rent, they have bills to pay, they have medical bills, all of that. So there's a lot of that pressure. And I've come across this amazing theory called the Dunbar Principle. You heard of it? It's the Dunbar Principle. Um, says that we at any given point cognitively are only able to have 150 meaningful relationships at any given time. Is this online? This is, this is a book. It's in life, in, in general. It's a, so yeah, so in life, as a human being, you can have 150 meaningful relationships at any given time, which could include your driver, your cook, your family, your friends. At one time. At one given moment, which wow. is why suddenly you find yourself not able to keep up or you meet someone and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry, I don't recognize you. Because also cognitively, we can remember, I think, about 5,000 faces at any given time. And now imagine you amplify this with social media. We're setting ourselves up for disaster. Yeah. And that's why if you, if you watch the movie Her, it's so interesting where she loses interest in the guy. She's the machine. Spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, because she's like, well, I can do so much more than you. I can have 4,000 conversations or infinity of conversations of an intellectual capability that you are not humanly capable of. And we're expecting to function at a level of intelligence and cognitive ability that is not unlocked yet in our brains. Maybe it will be one day. Maybe it will be. Yeah. So that just brings us back to don't be so hard on yourself. Yeah, but I feel like there's, you're right, there's so much more to take in. There's an information overload. There's a, um, I remember about four or five years ago when I would open Instagram and I would find a new creator or 10 new creators every week. Sure. And I was like, okay, I can't keep up. So now there are times when I go to events and I realize, oh my God, I can't keep up with my own industry, which makes me... But that's the thing. See, it's, it's not bad. It's not you not keeping up. And that's the whole beauty of understanding the Dunbar Principle. It's not you not keeping up. Your physical ability, just like suppose you had your leg in a cast, you could not climb Mount Everest. It's not, it's just the limitations of our human form. Welcome to my personal favorite segment, Slide Into My DMs. This is where I take a peek into my guests' DMs. And yes, I'll be sharing mine too. In this no holds barred segment, we nose dive into our guests' inboxes, as well as messages from you to us from my Instagram. Buckle up for a potentially scandalous round of messages and some sweet ones too. Let's go! So I have this little segment called Slide Into My DMs. All right. And you mentioned the 16-year-old Therese Gen Z sliding in with creepy DMs. So I want to ask you, what are the kind of creepy DMs you have possibly got? Oh my God, I blogged about all of them. I have this one guy who to this day says, hi, the H-Y, 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 like 12 times and then says, give me Arjun Kapoor's number. Ooh. One day, I'm just going to send this to Arjun Kapoor and say, should I just give him your number? And they have all kinds of stuff. Malaika might have a problem with that. <laughs> no, well, let's see. Maybe it's her. Um, <laughs> and then like all sorts, I get a lot of hi, hellos, lots of random people sending me their pictures, some dick pics. It's a mix of things, really. And the 16-year-old, I've, I've actually unpacked because I've had conversations with people who send me creepy messages. And I, and I, I asked them, I said, why do you do it? He said, ma'am, sorry for your attention. And that's the thing. And that's where you have to really understand. And, and that's where I started this thing called Ignore No More Online, which is a campaign to get people to understand that one, we have rights. So any kind of, um, you know, outraging woman's modesty, even virtually is a crime that you can be jailed for. And two is that we need to, aside from just bitching and moaning about what's happening and what's wrong and toxic internet and creepy DMs, we have to go back to education. There has to be online sensitization at a primary school level for anything to change. And because, and that's why I'm writing this book again, and I keep saying that it's the dummy's guide to be on the internet. We are taught everything, how to say, uh, good morning, thank you, please. Still, my friends with their kids, what do we say when someone gives a gift? Yeah, right? We don't do any of that for the internet. We don't prepare ourselves. You know, you're taught how to drive a car before you get into a vehicle. If I threw you a keys and gave you my car, you'd, you'd crash. We just assumed that we are going to behave online the way we do in real life, but that just didn't happen. It's also because too many worlds collided. And it's not that the creepy DMs are always coming from someone from a lower economic background. No, it just comes from this feeling that the internet is a free-for-all and the rules of uh, basic social decency don't apply here because it's virtual. So it's a game. And they'll throw dick pics at you or hate messages at you to get you to reply to them and then to get reply. And then and the thing is, you can't unsee that, right? Yeah. So I can't ignore it because I can't unsee it. And I think that in the real world, if someone came up and dropped their pants, like really opened the door right now, <laughs> we would call the police, right? But we've just, we've also let it go. 
too much. And and I think I take this back to you. Like so again, when I was probably like 16, 15 years old, I was probably wearing this mustard silver kameez, oily hair, glasses, and I'm explaining what I'm wearing because this comes from my patriarchal need to describe what I was wearing. But I remember going to watch a matinee show with my mother in Delhi, and some guy came and just put his hand on my breast. And today, my mom and everyone would have freaked out at that point. She said, just ignore it. Let's not make a scene. That's what we've done to the internet. And we made the same mistake in the real world many years ago. Actually, and I think that's beautifully linked together. We've done that for so long. We've done that for so long and we're making the same mistake. And now, if that happened to a uh, Gen Z and their mom, they would drag that guy kicking and screaming to jail, right? But we didn't do that. And we're making the same mistake on the internet today. And we're going to wake up when it's too late. Yeah. No, it's awesome that you're looking into these causes and that you have campaigns for these because I feel like every now and then you really do take find something new. And every time I look at a post from you, I'm like, wait, she's actually so clued in. And you're like in there trying to make a difference on so many levels. And I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to me today, Malini. You know, I really appreciate you taking the time out for this. So insightful, so much information. And you always share so much of your perspective on things. I always appreciate it. The original, original OG. The truest form of OG. Thank you, Anam. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Always happy to chat with you. We always had such a wonderful relationship. And more power to you. So excited to be part of your Thank you.